G'day and welcome to the Pursuit of Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Rosie Burrows, and I'm on a journey to find my freedom so that I can help you do exactly the same. Join me each week as I share the stories of everyday people who have found their own path to freedom. I'm not going to focus on job titles and accolades because I don't care about that stuff and neither should you. I want to uncover what truly makes you tick. Who are you when you step away from society's expectations and follow your heart? I still haven't figured it out yet. Have you? Either way, buckle up because it's going to be one hell of a ride. Welcome back to the Pursuit of Freedom podcast. Joining me today is Sarah Jolly Jarvis. She's all the way in the UK. I can't remember what town, Sarah, you can tell me in a minute, but Sarah's awesome. She is a podcaster. She's a mum. She's an entrepreneur. She's an international best-selling author. And she's all about doing sales without being a dickhead, which honestly, I'm all about and I love because I struggle a lot with sales. But Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to dive in. I want us to go back because I feel like your story is going to resonate with a lot of people, especially women, especially mums, because you weren't always an entrepreneur or a business owner, weren't you? What did you do before the Sarah of today? What was life like? I've always been around entrepreneurial stuff. My parents run their own business, but I went to uni and then off the back of uni, I got a, a corporate job and my parents were like, oh, if that's what makes you happy. I think they were a bit like, why would you do that? As supportive as ever, they were just like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> So yeah, I got into medical devices, pharmaceuticals over here in the UK and I was in that for 15 years. Mm. Um, I was you know, basically a rep, so I'd go around and speak to clients and drive around in my car lots of miles. And then the kind of progress is you then start coaching other members of the team. So I did that. And then Mm -hmm. an opportunity came up in in the company that I was in to work at the head office as a product manager. So I'd be using the sales team as my route to market. So I would train the sales team on how to sell my product and then support them with that sale of the product. And that would involve also going out Mm -hmm. seeing clients, et cetera, et cetera, but in a more product management role than a promotional role. So I did all that. I was getting mentored Mm -hmm. by the CEO. It turned out that my manager was intending to leave within the next couple of years. And so she was priming me and another colleague to go into her role as national sales manager. And then I decided to have a baby. (laughs) Which put a little spanner in the works but I was very adamant that I was going to come back and I was going to work full time etc etc and that that was my opinion even after she was born up until I think it was like seven or eight weeks old where I went around Mm -hmm. the nursery and they showed us around and they said oh we we put them in little tables so that they sit and eat almost like a family because for those which are here five days a week that's the only time and that they get to sit around as a family and I remember being Mm -hmm. like that's not happening I was like, no, you're not being my child substitute family. And I was like, I can't go back. So my company, in theory, was flexible, but not really. So if of the 400 employees, Mm. one person worked school hours, nobody worked part time. So one worked 9.30 till 3. And that was a big deal. I don't blame I don't blame them that was their culture they haven't moved on from that and but I didn't feel like I could do my job well and be the parent I wanted to be I know some people do it really well they work full-time and everything Mm. else but that just wasn't what I was wanting to do and so I was like I'm gonna have to do something else my husband at the time was in the online space doing digital marketing for a, a company and I would hear him on calls and I'd be like, oh, that person needs help with their sales or that person needs help with their sales. And I was like, because it, it's all well and good generating leads for people, but if then they're not able to convert them, that's really frustrating. And um, it also turns out there's an awful lot of people out there mm-hmm. who can't generate the leads. And so if you can't generate decent leads or enough of them, then that's when you really start to struggle. And um, then you put too much pressure on your sales and you're like, my sales is no good. And actually it's not your sales. It's the fact that you're (laughs) not cutting enough people through the door having conversations with you to actually generate the customers you want. You're never going to get 100% success rate. Um, You know, the sales guys um, that you're aiming at 40% is being really good a lot of people it's 25 percent, 30 percent of calls result in a sale and they're they're professionals 
Yes, you do here online. I've shared online the fact that I've had an 81% conversion rate on one of my, oh, I've got a, I've got a knock at the door. That's really helpful, isn't it? <laughs> Just bear with me a second. You're frozen. You're right. Now is the perfect time for me to interrupt with what I forgot to say at the beginning of the episode. You might have noticed this is the second episode I have released this week because I am increasing my release schedule. I have got so many amazing guests booked in that I just, I didn't want to, I, I couldn't keep you guys waiting and I couldn't keep my guests waiting for these episodes to come out. They already wait so, so long. So here we go. There's going to be two episodes a week. My goal is to hit 100 episodes by the end of May in 2025 because that'll mark two years since I started the podcast. All right, let's go back. Oh, well, that's what happens when you move to the country. The man comes and asks you if it's okay if he blocks the road with some cows. <laughs> <laughs> Bless him. Just very thoughtful. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so then um, it was a case of I started investigating, supporting people, and and I looked into what that might look like. I had a beta group, which turned out nothing like my expectations. And I think that's where my way of working really began to evolve was yeah. I was very clear that these people needed help in their sales calls. And it was like, it became very apparent to me very quickly that these people were putting way too much pressure on their sales calls. And so they needed to generate better quality leads. They needed to be having conversations and spending their time with um, more suitable mm -hmm. candidates, potential customers. And that came from my beta testing. That's why I'm always so keen with new businesses that people get out there and they start testing like straight away. I've got somebody at the moment I'm working with who has spent a year working on a signature course, having never spoken to a potential customer for that course. It is really painful. It's really sad because then you go out and you start marketing and you start marketing for that course because you've put so much effort into that course. And so then you're so committed to selling that option that you don't, you're not open then to actually what the market's telling you. So I began to help people with their businesses, normally solopreneurs, but some also some businesses where they've got a sales team or a small team in place and I can support them with that. I've done a little bit of dipping back into pharmaceuticals and supporting pharmaceutical companies as well. And then, yeah, I, and then I moved, we relocated because we could. So we moved to the coast. And so I now live in Devon. Uh, we've actually just relocated from one house to another as well down here. So um, that's all been going on. So yes, it is obviously, I could never have done that in my, it was my medical devices a career because I would have had to have been somewhere. The people who lived in Devon and Cornwall, the people who lived in Scotland never left their posts because once they got in with a company and they did well and they enjoyed it, they stayed there. And people didn't move on because there's not as many jobs around these areas and the territories are massive. And so I would never be home, which mm. wouldn't fit with the, the life that I'm trying to create for my family. Being able to do this has meant that we've been able to relocate. We both work online and we can be anywhere. So we chose to be here. If, if I go back to the, the version of you that chose sort of the corporate path, right, you grew up in an entrepreneurial family. You're clearly an entrepreneur. You love life at the moment. So what drew you to going down a more traditional path? I think I, I'd, I'd had from, so since we'd been traveling, so I took a bit of a break for 18 months and we'd, we'd traveled around the world when I was 30 with my now husband. After that, we've had kind of businesses on the side and actually sales and sales reps, a lot of them have businesses on the side and they are quite driven they are quite independent they are quite entrepreneurial I think what possessed me to want to go into a more corporate setting was my degree was in business and public policy very much following the path really so it was like the expectation was you went to university the expectation when you're at university was you've got a job and so I think when you're young you just like well this is the path well trodden there was one guy off my course who went and set up a sandwich shop after uni and I was like what was the point of doing your degree and I think there was that pressure to also use your degree it's I've got this degree why not use it and so that's kind of what, what sort of got me into in, into that kind of scenario did I think that I was going to end up running a business I don't think I did not at that stage I think I thought I would climb the corporate ladder but mm. actually yeah, 
it's painful and I'm okay at taking orders from somebody, but there's a lot of frustration. There was a lot of frustration for me in those roles. My biggest draw though, of going out independently, even though it was quite scary, was my family. And it, it's really weird what you do when you have children. Like it just, it's like these hormones just take over. And all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, and stuff that you would just never take yourself out of your comfort zone. And I think it is a massive, great big change. And it's something like 76% of women who work for themselves worked for themselves for the freedom and the flexibility. A lot of us are coming to entrepreneurial endeavors because we want the freedom and flexibility. What I find is that people tend to be, I'm really good at this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to sell this. And some people, they do it. Oh, I've had a breakthrough. I've had something happen and, and I want to support other people to do that. That's another kind of driving force. But I think a lot of the time they've got an area of expertise or an area that they're passionate about. But what they're not passionate about is the sales and marketing. So they find themselves with a business where they're spending more time doing sales and marketing than they are actually doing the implementation that they're so good at. And so I refer to that as like your little zone of genius. They spend so much time outside of their zone of genius that yeah. they can't even begin to, <laughs> to, to sort of remember what it was they signed up for. And it's like, you know, when you're doing something day in, day out that isn't natural to you yeah. and you don't enjoy, you can quite quickly become mm -hmm. disillusioned and I think that's why you've got all the different stats out there but the, the most banded around one is 70% of businesses fell within the first three years and there is that element of it's the slog you get disillusioned and you think oh you know what I'd be better off getting a job actually there are bits of my job that I <laughs> that I liked more than I like what I'm doing now um and that's how people can get really kind of they, they, they end up, they give up, they go back to, they go back to a job. That's a really valid point. And I've been in that headspace before. In fact, I hate to admit it, but recently I was like, oh, should I just go back and get a normal job? Just get some regular income and I don't have to worry about all the annoying bits that I don't like and that are hard. And the fact that I even had that thought to me is mm. terrifying because I was so miserable in mm. my traditional jobs. But I know there's a lot of business owners or entrepreneurs who hit that stage They're like, this is too hard. Yeah. And they give up. Maybe give up's not the word, but it, it feels too hard and too overwhelming. They don't know what mm -hmm. to do, so they go back to what they're used to. And I, let's think, <laughs> let's look at it fr fr from the lens of sales, right, because I think that's a big stumbling block for a lot of people. It's scary. How do we push through that? and stop hating sales. I think it's understanding why you're doing it. And I think it, it can be scary if you're chasing a sale. So if you're like, I need to make a sale this week, your energy coming into it is very scarcity. It's very desperate. It's very pressured. And so I don't think that helps. You're putting people off. You can get those vibes from people um, that they're just chasing that little bit too hard um, and from a place of kind of desperation. Um, so, you know, you, you need sales, but sales is like, I, I talk around in like gardens. It's like, you know, you've got a veggie patch and you've got to plant the seeds. You've got to put the effort in. You've got to tend to it. And people are, they'll neglect the sales side of stuff because they don't want to do it. And then all of a sudden they'll be like, I need a sale. So all the focus goes into that and they push themselves through and it's off oh, you, I'm safe. Yeah. And then that's when the, the feast and famine happens because then you get busy delivering for those individuals. You enjoy being busy mm. delivering for those individuals because that's what you're good at. And then you're back to, oh, wait a minute, that client's coming to an end or whatever's happened. And so you've got to find some another client. Yeah. And so then you're going back and you're intensely farming your little veggie patch. Whereas actually, if you can keep things ticking over, you can have things there ready. And I think that's a, the main thing is making sales a habit and also seeing it for what it is. I think it's very easy to get caught up in oh, I'm selling this person this thing. I'm trying to take their money from them. And especially women in business, we seem to think that if we get enjoyment from it, we shouldn't be charging so much. Whereas guys do not have a problem with enjoying what they do and charging for it. But I think we, we seem to feel <laughs> yeah. like, is there something wrong with that? Is we can work in both the currency of enjoyment and money. Right. You can receive both. I think that there's that sort of element of, oh, I, I've got to be pushing and, and asking this person for money and stuff. At this end of the day, if you truly believe that what you can do for that client is transformational, it has an impact, then why wouldn't you 
you know, want to help them. These people have a problem. They have something that they need solving. You can help them solve it. And you've got mm. to think that you can get money from anywhere. You can. Sometimes that might feel like that's not the case. You can sell organs. You can get money if you need money. But you can't. They, that person has a problem. Like you have time and you can go and you can spend that time doing a number of different things in exchange for money. Some of which you're not going to want to do, but you could. There's options for you. Whereas that person's problem mm. can only be solved by your solution. And so it's very easy to think, I need money, but we forget that actually that person needs your solution. And if you're thinking, actually, my solution's not all that special, then that's when, you know, get help, get somebody to, to work through with you and get clear on actually the impact you do have mm. and the value you do bring, because you do need to believe that you can wholeheartedly make a massive difference to that person. Um, you know, whether it's an essential or whether it's just a nice to have, it can, a nice to have can still have a massive impact. It's changing that attitude towards sales. And if you're in the service based side of things, then it's a real like two way, like figuring the person out process. It's not just a case of, oh, you know what? I, I need a customer. You'll do. Um, you know that you've got to work with this person closely. If you look beyond the transaction of the money, to the end point. So the result that you're trying to achieve for them. And it's like, can I achieve this result for this person? Is this person the right sort of person to achieve this result with? And that's what you're going for. You're mm. going for the testimonial because that testimonial will get you more clients because you can use that testimonial as evidence of look what I can do, look what this person's achieved with me. And then you can get more results for that, for, for, for people. It, it's looking beyond the transaction. Yeah. And how do we figure out our ideal customer, Sarah? Because you've, you've <laughs> touched on it a bit then. Who can you help the most, right? How on earth, I'm still figuring this out. It's driving me bonkers, i got to say. It makes me want to have a tantrum. But I, everyone I speak to, well, it depends where you're on your business journey, but a lot of people who are in a similar stage to me, yeah, it's, this, it's a big struggle and that self-belief mm -hmm. comes into it as well. But I'm guessing if you aren't clear on who you serve and who your ideal customer is, how are you going to be good at sales? Yeah. The, the worst thing you can do, so I speak to people and they're like, yeah, my, my offering, my offer, my product is suitable for anybody from the age of 16 to 60. And I'm like, but it, it's not. It can't be. You want it to be because you feel like if you niche down, you're like, I don't have mm. enough clients already. So if I niche down, I'm going to have even fewer. Whereas that's not the case. What is the case is that you can be too vanilla. You can be too middle of the road. You're not appealing to anybody. The online space is a great opportunity, as is in-person stuff. But you've got so many voices. Like at least with in-person things, if you're networking or, you know, you're in a particular geography and you've got bricks and mortar, then at least you're restricted by the geography and the competition and the, and the noise within that area. But outside mm. of that online, you're, there's no restrictions. If they can understand the language you speak, then you can in theory market to them. But the problem is so can everybody else. And so there is just so much. It's, it's like walking into a really noisy room. You can shout louder. You can market yourself. You can spend money on ads, et cetera, et cetera, to, to, to raise your noise above the general chatter. But really what's going to have the biggest impact is to really cut through. Like you, in a crowd, you hear your name, you turn around and you look around to see who called your name. Mm. That's what you're trying to do with your messaging. You're trying to call out your ideal customer. If you're going, hey, women, then it's, are they going to turn around? Are they going to be like, that's a bit generic. They can't be me. Or it can't be very important because they're not even you know, referring <laughs> to specifically me. And, and that's where you're at. Whereas if you can be like all the women under the age of 20 and over the age of 15 come over here, then it's a lot more specific. And you're thinking, wait a minute, what have they got? What have they got for me? And so being able to niche down, like, you know, for example, like people say, oh, yeah, you know, women, I can, I, very often I hear people say, yeah, I can 25 to 45. And I'm like, but within that age group, you've got people, and this is, it's mm -hmm. more about their life stage. Are they individuals? I've got clients who market to people mm -hmm. who 
uh, pre-children, people who have children, people who are of childbearing age but don't have children, choose not to and won't have children. I've got people who have got kids aiming at uh, individuals, women who are um, the, the kids of flown the nest. And so you're talking to them very, very differently. It's somebody who's not got children, who is below the average age for having them, so they're in that carefree stage, then talking to them about kids find the nest, they don't relate to it. You're talking to them about their motivations for, for getting into it, to re-looking at themselves, they're just not resonating. I've been there. It wasn't an easy journey to become a parent for us. And so I, you know, it really used to pee me off when people used to assume that have you not got kids yet? So any sort of marketing, mumsy marketing at the time was a proper turn off for me. That wasn't their fault. There are them, they're marketing to people who mm. are mm. of, who have got that circumstance. It's about calling to you. If you're going to be somebody who bangs on about having kids, about balancing family, et cetera, et cetera, I was not a good candidate for that person right there because it was just too much for me. So it was better that I knew straight up that this person was going to bang on a lot about children and therefore I could go and find somebody who didn't. And that's the thing. You're thinking, oh, I'm putting people off and I don't want to put people off, but you can't be everything to everybody. Mm, mm. And for those people now, I would be a really bad person to be around for somebody like me when I was struggling to have children. And so it's it's good Mm -hmm. that I know. And it's good that you're you're kind of Mm. letting them know in advance so they can go and find their people and that the people who are drawn to you can work with you, they can relate to you. And that's the thing you want to be relatable. You can think, oh, well, you know what I'll do? I'll just park everything personal. Mm -hmm. But then people buy from people and who's the person? And you don't need to be some crazy performing clown on TikTok dancing on the table in a Wonder Woman outfit. Some people do. You don't have to do that. It's the best thing to do is to be yourself. And that's what regularly people say is, is how do I remember how to be online? And I'm like, they're being as close to yourself as you possibly can. Mm. There are probably bits that you want to tone down or bits that you might want to ramp up. But in general, being true to yourself is the best way to find your people. And the more off piece you go with your natural self, the more off piece you're going to go with your clients. Um, if you think about friends, if you think about when you've tried to be somebody different, mm. you end up with a group of friends that you're like, who are you? How have I attracted this? And you've attracted this by not being you. Um, it is the same with your customer base. It's different if you're a product-based mm. business because it doesn't matter so much. But if you are a service-based business and you're going to have to spend time around these people, then you want to make sure they're your sorts of people. Yeah. And on that being yourself part, I think that's, especially true in sales because there's all these people, all these gurus, whatever you want to call them out there, who have very strong opinions about how you should sell. Mm -hmm. There's some very opinionated people out there. And as early business owners, you try all the things. This is the way that works. This is how you're going to get lots of money and help lots of people. And it just doesn't feel right that it seems to take people a while to admit that and go, this isn't working for me. Doesn't mean that strategy doesn't work for other people, but this isn't working for me. So how how do we figure out our style for sales? Because am I right in saying that there's not one way to do sales? Definitely. There is no one way to do anything around business. There's so many different ways of doing things. And I think I always liken sleaze to, because my book, Selling Without Sleaze, is teaching you to not be so sleazy, is to help you to feel more authentic. And sleaze is like a chili scale. For some people, you're going to be like, oh, that's a bit much. I can't, I I don't want to do that. And that's absolutely fine. It's finding it within your remit. And what I found with clients is that some people be like, oh, I don't think I can do that. And I'm like, that's fine, okay? If it gets to the point Mm. where I'm like, yeah, that's fine, but the likelihood is that you're going to be selling less if you don't do this, then I flagged it with them. They can make a decision. At the end of the day, it's your business. If you don't want to go down the route of, of focusing in on one kind of audience and one niche, then that's your choice. Will you make life harder for yourself? Absolutely. Is it still doable? I think it can be. Yes. I think it's mm. a lot harder. You've got to throw a lot more lot more messages out there to mm. see what sticks. But you could do it, but I wouldn't recommend it. 
But when it comes to sort of promotions and deadlines mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff, some people are well up for a deadline promotion. Some people are like, no, it doesn't feel right. And so, you know, you've got to do it within your mm-hmm. kind of um, comfort zone. And that's the main thing is staying true to yourself. But it's creating a toolkit. A lot of the time, it's it, it, if you can create go-to responses, so that's what I encourage people to do is to create their own responses to their own sales scenarios. So if somebody says to you, oh, that seems expensive, what do you do? And if you have a system where this person Mm. says this, right, okay, this is how I say in advance. And I'm not talking necessarily about scripts. I'm just talking about having planned out in your head. You may have it written somewhere. And what you say when somebody says something is, okay, in response to that, I say this. Um, And all it is, is it's just a different way of communicating. It's a more structured way of communicating. And like anything, when we start learning something, it's very difficult to to trust ourselves because there's all these people out there doing it better than us. And it's very natural to adopt somebody else's way of doing things because it's worked for them. And then to realize actually that doesn't. It's a bit like going to university and following the norm. I went to university, I followed the norm, I went and did a corporate job. And then because that's what everyone else is doing and it's safe, we naturally follow the crowd. But then over time, you're like, actually, this doesn't seem to be working for me. This doesn't feel right. And understanding what does feel right to you, like that self-awareness piece. And I was talking to somebody last week Mm. and I said to them that the sort of microscope that's put on your personality and your flaws and your areas of expertise when you start working for yourself is, is, is so intense. And it's understanding that, okay, this is where I feel okay. This is where I don't feel okay. And to speak to somebody regularly in the street about where's your comfort zone when it comes to sales, they're probably like, why what? Because it's just not relevant to them. And so, you know, you've got to find your way. And some of that is is discovering it for yourself. But, Mm. you know, when you think I feel awful, I've spoken to people with some real horror stories of pressure selling techniques and making people feel bad. Um, so yeah. picking at the pain point and things like that. And I've, like, the, the conversations I've had with people where they've been like, I felt awful. People have said to me, actually, if I carried on like this, I'd probably kill myself. It is very frightening then. Like, that's not your area of expertise to talk to somebody and mm. support somebody around that. But that's the scenario people have found themselves in because they've taken up sales techniques that haven't been right for them. And so, and their audience. And so it is around creating Mm. a toolkit for yourself. That was the reason I wrote my book was to make it more accessible for people to change people's outlooks on sales. And also it's no good to just change someone's outlook. You know, you can't think like this anymore. And it's okay, but then what am I supposed to do instead? And so, you know, to support that, that's why I've got in the book around helping people to create their toolkit so that actually they've got an alternative to the safety blanket that is somebody else's approach so like my Mm. worst case like my worst nightmare would be for people to to basically take on my sales approach and just be a mini me because they're not me they're not attracting they're not wanting to work with my audience Mm. they're not wanting to sell the expertise that I'm selling and so the best thing they can do is is to is is to find their own way which works for them and works for their audience it takes time it takes experimentation but you build longer term and I think that's the thing is in the short term if you go in there and you're very pressure sell yes you can make sales in the short term but you damage long term you don't get people coming to you three four years down the line Mm. because they were absolutely put off and run a mile after their first experience with you whereas I've got people who've, who've had conversations with me like six years ago now and who then appear at the right time for them and start working with you that doesn't happen if you use bad sales approaches people always remember how you made them feel Mm. and so you know how do you want to make that person feel what do you want to leave that person feeling and thinking and what are your thoughts on sharing price ahead of time because (laughs) I've heard so many different opinions on this and I don't know where I stand so I want to hear your opinion what are your thoughts do we share our prices ahead of time so I would tend to say on a website or something like that, then having prices starting from is a good idea. It gives them a starting point. So if you have an hourly okay. rate, if you have a lower priced course, give them the price starting from, which is a fair re- 
sort of reflection of the starting price of working with you. So for example, I'm not gonna put prices starting from $3. I have a $3 course, but that doesn't give them a fair taste of what it would be to to work with me. And so what I would say is I'd probably give my hourly Mm -hmm. rate. Mm-hmm. And prices start from. Do I often provide okay. my hourly rate? Absolutely not. No. Most people go into packages. There's not an awful lot you can do in an hour. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you can set somebody on the right direction, but that's normally not enough. But it gives them an idea. And then if they're thinking, you know what, I want something really bargain basement, mm-hmm. they know that that's not the case. But the problem with providing your full price. So for example, signature course, you're providing your full price up front. The challenge with that is that there's no context. So there's no context over what they get. You're relying on them to read Mm. all the details and not just cut to the price. You're also unable to relate it to their circumstance. If you tailor it, for example, then I'd be like tailored prices start from. It might be that the minimum you do with somebody is a two week session, like two sessions. So then quote two sessions. But the the key thing is to, Mm. to be clear on okay this is generally what I sell and this is the starting point for that option what it does is it saves you from wasting your time it saves that individual from wasting their time um to put your full price full up there to start with is just it it, it, there's no point if if that was the case if you could sell off because I've I've seen people Mm. recently I know that somebody who's encouraging people to do it and is to put their price in their bio um on LinkedIn And I just Mm. feel like that's way too forward. Mm. What you're going to do is you're going to get people who discount or buy based on price, whereas actually they should be on outcome. There's not enough room up up on your bio Mm. for a a case study. But that's what you'd want up there for first and foremost is this is the results I'm getting. This is what people can expect. And that helps an an, an awful lot more than providing Mm. a price point. Because if you're paying a thousand bucks, but you you don't get Mm. it, um, then... It's that was an absolute waste. <laughs> Whereas if you're paying a thousand bucks and you're getting a really mm. good result or you're getting an amazing result and everything turns around and you're making five figures a month within weeks, then how much more are you willing to pay for that? But it's context. I always say, because I regularly talk to people over, people think that the way to increase their price is to increase the time scale that people can work with them, for example. And I'm always like, actually, if I could say to you, you know what, Rosie, I could I could teach you to get a million pounds tomorrow or I could work with you for a year and teach you how to make a million pounds. <laughs> Which one are you going to pay more for? You're going to go for the I tomorrow. want it tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're like, oh, a whole year's worth of work. And it's, no, people want the results. And that's a really good example of where the, the context isn't there when you put your price on your on your websites or on your Facebook page or whatever else is there's no context mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there's no context to the speed at which and that's where you want to have those conversations you can qualify people so much more than you used to be able to in the dms and sometimes you can sell to people in the dms particularly if they've seen something they're convinced about it they're just checking a few details what i would say is there's a lot more movement towards that mm-hmm. than getting people on a discovery call for like an hour 90 minutes it's just too long it's always worth bearing that in mind is that a lot can be done before you even have a call with them. And again, what value is it? People are busy. People value their time. And so it's like, do they need, do they need that length of time on a call? Yeah. So do you, do you recommend selling on a sales call or are you just more flexible? If it makes sense in the DMs, do it there or j- only jump on a call when it makes sense to? Yeah. It, that's my kind of rule of thumb. I think that if you are inexperienced at selling in Mm. the dms or you're inexperienced at sales the best thing you can do is have a call because you get real-time feedback yes you put yourself under more pressure okay but you understand the context of what people are saying because you've got no tone you've got no understanding of tone on messenger and 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 message Mm -hmm. and so what i would tend to do is i need to know information and this is the thing with qualifying is people want to be qualified do they want to be asked how much their budget is potentially not but do they want people to say, what's your situation? What are you looking for? Yes, they do. Because they want to feel like that's a, a genuine good option for them. So that person needs to be able to, to ask the questions to find out if this is the right solution for them. So often I speak to people and they're like, well, this person's, you know, they've, they've, they've messaged me and said they're interested. And I was like, but are they a good fit? 
and they're like, oh, I don't know. But they're like, but I'm, they're, they're like, but I'm just going to sell to them anyway because they, they want the client. And so that client wants to feel like you're qualifying them and you're making sure it's a good fit for them too. And um, so by doing that, you can ask a few questions and then be like, hey, should we just jump on a quick call? Because actually I've got these questions will be quicker. Everyone likes a time efficiency. Jumping on a quick call, 15, 20 minutes is enough to commit. Find out more information. If it goes well, then great. If it doesn't go well, then it's okay to call it a day early. But, you, you know, if you've committed to an hour where you're going to go through and give an audit and do this and do that. And in reality, if you get one in four converting, that's good. That means you're spending four hours to get one client. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to build those four hours into your costings. And how many people can you do in a day? How can you scale? And mm -hmm. that's before you've even started with the actual delivery. Also, you've also set the tone. That person has a lot mm. of time with you up front. You're either going to leave them feeling, oh, I pay my money and then I get a sub, a sub service in comparison to what I got when you were chasing me, or they're going to expect that length mm. of time with you. So they're either going to feel robbed or they're going to feel like that's the normal. Right, right. And so it's setting the tone of the relationship. We mm. all know in relationships not to make yourself too available, not to be too needy early on because it gives the wrong indications and it sets the tone. Don't be the one who's over eager. It's the same thing in sales. Sales is like dating. There's so many nuances to it. Hearing someone like you talk about it is really cool. I hear it and go, yeah, that makes sense. But if I was to sit by myself and go, oh, should I share the price on my website? Wouldn't have a clue. And yeah. I want to touch on this money objection, right? The, that's expensive. I can't afford that because that's a common one I've come across. And I'm curious, how do you respond to that? Because I feel <laughs> most of the time it's not really an I can't afford it objection. I feel like there's another reason, but that's what people say. So how, how do you approach that? So you've got to think, right, that that's perceived value. It's a massive bit of feedback on what they believe mm. what you're offering is worth. And the vast majority of the time, that's a massive reflection on your sales conversation, on your sales process, on how pre-sold that person is. So you haven't related the outcome thereafter sufficiently to the offer that you are providing mm -hmm. them with. So that either the, the problem isn't big enough that you've gone and associated your offer with, or you've just got them on a call, you've been really enthusiastic, you've just blurted out all the features, and probably not the benefits, and then they're <laughs> like, oh, and they're trying to piece together in their head, how does this actually work for me? You've got to appreciate that price objection, yeah. I can't afford, that's a bit that's a bit above my budget, are things that they're, they're the most likely objections because they're the easiest ones to say, and they're the hardest ones to overcome. And so they know that they're a bit home and dry if they say to you, I can't afford that. Mm. So what you want to do is to understand, okay, what, what was your budget? So earlier on in the sales conversation, which is really tricky because a lot of this time, this is a learning for next time. It's not unsalvageable at the point of that's expensive, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you're really backpedaling. And so whenever you get that kind of objection, the best thing you can do is to review your sales process, to review what went on in the call. If you have call recordings, if you do it on Zoom, it's very natural for calls to be recorded. So you can go onto the call recording and see from there what went wrong, where you could have been more detailed, et cetera, et cetera. And so definitely it is a massive red flag to go back through and to improve your sales process. It's something that you do naturally, salespeople do naturally all the time. I used to come out of the sales course with the sales guys. Some of these guys had been doing sales for near on 40 years. They were near retirement and we would still come out, sit in their car and they would go through, this went well, this didn't go so well, this is what I do differently next time. And it's just second nature to them. They were the efficient salespeople. It wasn't mm. me because, gosh, like at the time, like for some of these guys, I was in my 20s and they're like this little jump start comes and tries to tell you what to do. But it's actually they welcomed that sounding board. They welcomed the new energy, the different perspective on things, the younger perspective on things, the less jaded perspective on a market. When you think about it, people coming in and having a new perspective, it's great. 
um, but only if you see it as great and not a threat. And so these guys would go through and they'd be like, oh, this isn't great and that wasn't so good and this was good and we'd talk about it. And also I'd have a different perspective because I wasn't in it at the time. And so I wasn't having to think on my feet as well as, as observe what went well and not so well. So it was really good opportunity. You've got that with Zoom. Zoom's there. It, like, can even fathom can even write notes for you now. And so you can go through and you can be like, oh, okay, I've got a, this is a bit weak here. I didn't pick up on that, et cetera, et cetera. As far as saving that sale right in front of you as that comes out of that individual's mouth, it's understanding, okay, if you didn't find out the budget, she should have done earlier on in the call. Understand, okay, what budget are you working to? Okay, and if that person's willing to work with you, if they do see the value, mm. if it's a genuine objection of money, I don't have the money for it, but they do see the value, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. then it's okay, so how can we work together to to make this happen? And they'll be open to that because they want they see the value and they want to make it happen. If they're not convinced, then that's when you're gonna get, well, no, it's probably better, I leave it for another time, etc. If they're willing to work with you on payment plans, if they're willing to work with you on okay, I could probably shave this back so never ever drop your price okay you're providing the same thing so therefore your cost per hour your your income per hour is just going down and i've met people who've dropped it and dropped it and actually they've been better off working in mcdonald's which is just soul destroying okay you don't want to drop the price and and keep the same offer but what you can do is you can shave bits off it's okay you can have less time with me you can do group check-ins etc etc there's ways to do to work around it that you can reduce it to come to their sort of budget level sometimes which is why it's good to have a starting from price if they're thinking it was 20 pounds or 20 dollars and it's actually 200 it's you are so far apart that there's just Mm -hmm. there's no point Mm -hmm. and then if that's genuinely unrealistic for your market and they're only going to get terrible people providing that service at that price then tell them because they don't know, they're not in the market all the time. So in a very nice, caring, right, you know, from a place of caring, that, that is really low. You're unlikely to be able to find somebody who's half decent to do that. You're probably better off training to do it yourself than getting somebody else to do it for you. That kind of conversation can really help. It puts that seed of doubt in their minds. You've let them know, you've informed them, you've given them more information on it. And so they're much more likely, you're a source that they can trust to come back to you in future you could also find out from them okay you could reiterate you could go back it's tricky but you can go back to the sales process so you'd be like well you know, what are you trying to get at here how important is this and it's like okay well I said I'd sort out x but actually that's like 10th on my list of problems right now my main problem is this and it's fair enough and it mm. might be that for that main problem mm. you can't help And that's the thing is I've had conversations with people. I've been like, you know what? Right now, this isn't your problem. I had a client a few weeks ago and I was like, right now, do you need this this business to be working? Do you need to spend this time on this business or do you need to focus on your family? And they were like, Mm. I don't need it. I just want to do it. And I was like, we'll park you here. Come back when you are in a position to focus in on your business. I speak to people on a daily basis who aren't in that position where they need the money from their business. And so they're not able to park it when some crisis happens within their family. And so that person was in a really good position to be able to do that. Right. And so mm. why not? I've come across a lot of gurus who are, and they've said it to me, you're not committed, et cetera, et cetera, because my children come first. That for me, that's important. For other mm. people, mm. it will be their lifestyle or other commitments. You've got a really lovely dog. If you're like, no, mm-hmm. I'm not going to go and ship off to another country because that's not a thing for me because I want to stay here mm. with her. But it's, it's what's important to you and it's you're not going to compromise on that. And it is understanding where does my, where, where are my points at which there's no compromise. And with price, you want to have that kind of area of no compromise. I'm, I'm not willing to do that for that. Mm. Don't just chase the money because the problem is if mm. somebody where you reduce your price, you're more, then the, more, more than likely going to be your more tricky customers. And so... It's one of those things that you drop the price to be helpful and then before you know it, they've got you run ragged and actually you could have used that time to find a customer who was willing to pay the amount who wouldn't have run you ragged. Mm, Yeah, and it's when you're desperate for that sale that you're taking on clients that actually, yeah, they're going to be a pain in the butt and actually are they really the person you want to be working with? No. It's that scarcity idea and I think that's why it's Mm. really important to be always feeding that veggie patch 
and to always be making an effort to have conversations with people. I say to people, what have you got in your pipeline? And they're like, nothing. And I'm like, that's not good enough. Like, yeah. it, there's no reason, there's no reason why you can't have people, even if they're a bit of a long shot, even if there's no reason why you had a conversation with somebody who's a potential customer and you shouldn't have a few calls lined up for the diary. If you're putting your time and effort into your sales and it doesn't take that much time and effort, it's half an hour a day, an hour a day is enough to, to be generating those leads. It's just working smart. Mm. I feel like I have a million other questions. This topic is fascinating to me. Um, <laughs> and I, I highly recommend people read your book, actually. It's, is it Selling Without Sleaze or Sales Without Sleaze? Selling, yeah, Selling Without Sleaze. Go check it out. Very affordable, very actionable. And if you're in Australia, it's actually on the Kindle Unlimited thing and you can just sign up for a 30-day free trial and read it that way. (laughs) (laughs) Didn't come from me. And I think it might be, depending where you are in the world, on Audible too. It is, yes. It is on Audible, yeah, by me, which was painful. (laughs) Now, Sarah, this is a question I like to ask all my guests and I think it – I really want to hear your answer, actually, because earlier in our conversation, you said, I think it was something like 70% of women get into business for more freedom and flexibility. So I'd love to know, what does freedom mean to you? Oh, um, I think the not being answerable to people. I, I think it's interesting, actually, because I think we can set our own boundaries on freedom. And I think sometimes we're like, we can't do that. And it's actually, why can't you do that? It's actually that appreciation of choice. And I think actually more than anything, it's the awareness of having choice. I speak to people quite often who I'm like, you have a choice here. And they're like, I don't have a choice. And it's, no, you do. You just, for whatever reason, you've written this off. Like when I jokingly said about selling organs, obviously you've only got so many organs you can sell. It's a choice and it's a boundary. And it's it, it just points out that actually there are options open to us that straight away you're going to be like, I'm not going to sell a kidney. Mm-hmm. And it's okay, so that's a no. But then what's a yes? And I think we can get ourselves so stuck on what we can't do that we then can't flip it and, and be creative mm. and understand what we can. And so... I think it's actually the self-awareness of that sense of choice is freedom for me. Mm. Yeah, that resonates. Choice is huge. And I agree with your opinion that we have, we have choices and we make choices. And I, some people don't like me because I call them out on their bull crap. Oh, I wish I could do what you're doing. You're so lucky. Mm-hmm. Because I live in my van and I'm traveling. I'm like, I am a lucky person, but you know what? I made a choice to do this and it wasn't easy, yeah. but I chose it. I chose not to stay in the situation I was in. But you, you, that person over there, you're miserable and you're choosing to stay in that situation. Yeah. We all have different choices. They might not always be the ones we like, but there's a choice involved. So I think taking that agency yeah. is important. I really like that you've linked freedom to that. Definitely. It's, it's definitely the mindset behind it. You've got to have freedom. There's freedom there. And, and I think when we went traveling, I appreciated the amount of freedom you get from having a British passport um, that some people never mm. get a passport. You have your freedom right there. You have that opportunity right. to travel, to go to countries, to not be restricted, to be allowed in, to be allowed to work. We've got working holiday mm. visa, whatever, agreements between Australia and England and New Zealand and England, the UK. And some people never use that, but it's there. And so I think that's the thing is you've, your mind's got to be open to it. Sometimes you've got to be aware that it exists. I don't even know how old I was when I realised that you can get a working holiday visa, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I remember I was 28 when I realised it expires when you're 30. And yeah. and it was, it, it's just one of those things that, you know, you've got, it, it, there's all these options around you, but you've got, your head has to be in the right place to take those opportunities. And I think that's where the the difference can happen. Mm. It is very easy for our minds to keep us trapped. We are, as humans, we are programmed to keep ourselves where we are. 
because we feel safe and actually you mm. need to, to mm. the growth mm. happens outside of that space yeah I agree and it's like we we're programmed to avoid pain right or that risk or that fear of failure yeah. and we tend to focus on the things that could go wrong we just obsess over oh what if this happens what if I don't make any sales what if I don't money make any money I have to stay in this job I've got a mortgage to pay I've got kids I've got this I've got that they're all valid concerns but what about the potential upsides what about all the opportunities I think if we become just even just a little bit more open to daring to to dream a little bit, great things yeah. can happen. And once you start looking for opportunities, it's amazing how many come your way. It really is. I think that's the thing is, is it's thinking positively. It's actually, yes, what happens if, but what happens if this does really well? Mm. And I think a lot of people leave because they're motivated by the dream and then they're hit by the reality. And I think that a lot of the time, the reality is between the worst case scenario and the dream. Oh, dreams. yes. It's the middle ground. But I feel at times, if it was a graph, because I love a graph, but if it was a graph, you'd have that kind of optimal and the kind of worst case scenario. And we are roller coastering between those two lines. And sometimes you are heading towards, this is amazing. Yes. And then it turns around and it goes back down again. Yeah. But that's, it's life. It's not, it, nothing is fun all the time. And I think the problem with human nature is that mm. it's programmed to keep us safe, not happy. And so you can be kept in a really unhappy place Ooh. because you're too afraid to, to, to make a change because human nature was not designed to keep us happy. It was designed to keep us safe. The problem is the whole safety thing is that we naturally stay places where mm. we're unhappy because that's not what we're motivated towards preventing so as long as you're alive your head's going to keep you in that situation mm. regardless of how unhappy mm. you are that is so yeah. powerful i have never heard it quite put that way that's really mm. powerful but it's it just it makes sense we're designed to keep ourselves safe not happy whoa not happy. Yeah, that's huge ah oh, sarah thank you if there's one message you want to leave our listeners with today most of them are female about 70 percent, which i love all real breakers most of them early stage entrepreneurs is there anything any take-home message you want to leave them with i would say to them to, to get help and support with your business journey okay i mm. think that it's lonely you can make mistakes you can get, to, you don't even want to get to the point of feeling like you want to give up. You know, having that kind of safety and security there of somebody pointing in the right direction, keeping you out of making silly mistakes and costly mistakes is massive and something that you really want to invest in. That doesn't have to be me. Yes, I do that. But find somebody mm. who resonates with you, who's doing the things that you'd like to be doing that you can see yourself doing. Mm. That's the thing is I've had lots of mentors, some great some not so great all very successful they've all been really good at what they do but what they do hasn't necessarily been what I do and find somebody that you're like actually you know what I could see myself right. dancing on that table in a Wonder Woman outfit if that's what they do so yeah I think that's the kind of main thing is is don't do it alone it doesn't have to be massive investments mm. it can be as simple as starting with somebody's book and right. but don't assume that you're supposed to know all mm. of this. Business isn't second nature to everybody. If you're the first person in your world to have set up their own business, why do you think that you should know all the things? People are so quick to do classes when they're having babies. Right. Yeah, babies. People in the caves used to have babies. It's been going on for, <laughs> for how many? Mm. Thousands, millions of years of people <laughs> having babies. A long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we go for classes. Like we go for classes to, to learn about that. And so why mm. wouldn't we go to classes to learn about having a business and running a business effectively? And that's worth thinking around. Yeah. Don't put too much pressure on yourself and don't beat yourself up for what you don't mm. know. Yeah. Why, why should we know it all? I think there's a lot of shame surrounding that. If you don't get it right the first time or if you have to ask for help, like, oh, you're not yeah. good enough. But why shouldn't we and ask so for help? And so many entrepreneurs have failed. Like so, so many, like Richard Branson, like we don't want to – you don't want to aspire to be a failure, obviously, but you want to be realistic with no. everyone fails at some point. Yeah, absolutely. And this is gonna this is a yes or no question because I'm mindful of your time, but I have to ask. Mm -hmm. Have you ever failed? 
in business. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We had to fold a business because, oh, you, I'm supposed to say yes. I'm supposed to say yes <laughs> um, but yeah, like we had to fold a business because it wasn't scalable. We'd had investors. There's a lot of money gone into this business, but it just wasn't, it wasn't going to be the scalable business we thought it was when it came to actually testing it. Absolutely. Um, I don't, I don't think I know anyone, anyone who's done very, who's, who's, who I would classify as a success in business who hasn't had a failure. It's just not what we necessarily talk around. Sarah, thank you so much. We have been dealing with a little bit of lag, or at least I have on my end, but I just want to say thank you so much. You are a font of knowledge. And again, I highly recommend people go check out your book. It's Selling Without Sleaze. I will put a link to that in the description. Go follow Sarah. I think Facebook is your main social media, is Facebook it? Facebook and Instagram. I'm sorry, Instagram. I'm also on LinkedIn. So helping people to set up their business from their kind of corporate. All the places. Life. All the places. Awesome. And Sarah mentioned before, she is a business mentor. So check that out if you're interested. I don't think she's going to sell to you with any sleazy business involved. That's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. <Andy. laughs>